As a welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen, members of the society and um, uh, people from outside the society, welcome guests to the second Wilkinson and Willoughby lecture. <clears throat> it's a high point, the high point really, of our <clears throat> annual program when we invite a leading figure from outside the narrow world of Germanistic to come and speak to us. Last year we began, the first lecture was given by the great pianist Alfred Brendel. Our guest today, as you know, is the distinguished sociologist Wolf Lebanese, who is the current director of the Berlin Wissenschaftskolleg and a member or chairman of more or less any academy, academy or scholarly powerhouse that you can think of. <laughs> so we are greatly honored to have you with us here today, Herr Lebanese. Seien Sie herzlich willkommen bei der English Good Society. I shan't say another word in German because we're going to have your lecture in English, which is a good thing for anybody who is drawn in by your international reputation, but doesn't happen to speak German. Wolf Lepenis is not a Germanist, but you might not notice a lot of difference. If you read any of his books, or if you merely look over the long and substantial list of his publications, he has returned again and again to the place of culture and within culture, the place of literature, in civil society and politics. That relation is perhaps even more thick with problems in Germany than in other societies. So our guest is intimately at home with questions that constantly concern us too, though we wouldn't claim to be sociologists. This evening's lecture, as you will have seen from the abstract, points up literature's potential in an opposition that couldn't be more extreme. On the one hand, the moral depravity of Nazism, on the other, the humane power of Goethe. So there you are, we are absolutely on home ground, Goethe. It was an ambitious conception indeed. And beyond the crisis of Germany in 1945, there is the permanent question, what humanizing and enlightening effect can literature ever have? The belief that it can, at least in some measure, is surely what gives a meaning to our activities as scholars and teachers, and even just as readers. We very much need encouragement. Did it work in Germany after the Second World War? Can it work today? The need isn't far to seek. Elipenes, we are on the edge of our seats. Thank you very much for this very kind invitation. It's a great honor for me to give the Wilkins and Willoughby lecture. And uh, I shouldn't even think of that I'm following Alfred Brendel. So the expectations might be high and I don't know how to fulfill them. I would like to thank Jane Lewin and Dr. Hilliard for having prepared this Zoom session, which is still strange to me, I must admit. And I would also like to thank I don't know whether he is uh, here, Jeremy Adler, because I have the feeling that he might have something to do with this invitation. So let me begin. Modern science begins with a promise. Members of the newly founded Royal Society commit themselves not to meddle with divinity, metaphysics, morals, politics, grammar, rhetoric, or logic. The spectacular progress of the empirical sciences tempted other disciplines to imitate them. At the same time, the urge to fill the moral void left by the sciences became stronger and stronger. These are the core issues I have dealt with in my professional life as historian of ideas and as a sociologist. This is also the background of my lecture today. It has three parts. I'll start by describing Beatrice Webb's sociological novel as a genre of compromise in which the narrative and the scientific aspects of sociology merge and form the example of a moral science. Today, this genre has found its sequel in the so-called socio-autobiographic novel. In the second part, I recall a mission in which the Goethe Society played an enormous role to provide the German people immediately after the downfall of the Nazi regime 
with a moral compass by turning the Germans into avid Goethe readers. In conclusion, I shall look at current programs aiming to turn business managers and professionals into moral leaders with the help of great books. So first, the unwritten novel. As academic latecomers, sociologists had to decide whether to mimic the natural sciences or adopt a narrative attitude that made them resemble essayists and novelists. Both decisions were a hindrance to achieving a stable disciplinary identity. Sociology became a fluctuating discipline and has to a certain degree remained so today. From the middle of the 19th century onward, literature and sociology contest each other the claim to offer an understanding of the modern world. To illustrate this tension, I have chosen an author whom I hardly need to introduce to a London audience, Beatrice Webb, born Beatrice Potter, the great social reformer and together with Sidney Webb, whom she, mar whom she married in 1891, the founder of the London School of Economics and of the New Statesman. Beatrice Webb was raised in a household impregnated with the worldview of economic utilitarianism. But young Beatrice tried to translate passages from the Faust of her dear Goethe. She read Wilhelm Meister and felt called to become a writer herself. Admiring novelists like Honoré de Balzac, who had offered incomparable insights into human nature and society. But when her cousin, Charles Booth, undertook this monumental sociological survey on life and labor of the people of London, Beatrice Webb became his collaborator. Her first publication appeared within the framework of this inquiry. Yet she was haunted, she wrote, by a longing to create characters and to move them to and fro among fictitious circumstances to put the matter plainly by the vulgar wish to write a novel. Her desire to speak in my own words and sentences was at length realized in her autobiography. In January, 1917, she set about composing the book of my life that was later, later to be called My Apprenticeship, commended on account of its literary qualities, even by those who were to put it mildly no friends of the webs like Virginia Woolf. The autobiography had turned into a sociological novel. Literature and the social sciences complemented each other. It was a genre that has achieved a remarkable upswing in our time. I'm thereby referring to the so-called socio-autobiographic novel, where the author places his or her life story in the context of contemporary society. In many cases, these novels might even be described as sociology in action. Quite a few of their authors were students or even professors of sociology. Francophone authors predominate, among them Annie Arnaud, Didier Eribon, and Edouard Louis. But nowhere, perhaps, is the claim of the socio-autobiographic genre more clearly formulated than in James David Vance's bestseller from 2016, Hillbilly Elegy, a memoir of a family and culture in crisis. All these books acted as a socio-political forewarning system. In France, they anticipated the movement of the Yellow Vests, the Gilets Jaunes. In the United States, Vance described a social and mental landscape that made the rise of Donald Trump understandable, who was elected in the same year Vance's book was published. Just as a footnote, Vance has become a member of the Republican Party and is running for a Senate seat in Ohio in November. The socio-autobiographic novels are reminiscent of a sociological classic from 1959, Charles Wright Mill's book, 
the sociological imagination, in which he called the socio-autobiographical approach the prerequisite for any sociological research. No social study, Mills wrote, that does not come back to the problems of biography, of history, and of their intersections within a society has completed its intellectual journey. Students had to understand what is happening in themselves as minute points of intersections of biography and history within society. Mills underlined the importance of intellectual craftsmanship. Quote, you must learn to use your life experience in your intellectual work, continually to examine and interpret it. In this sense, craftsmanship is at the center of yourself and you are personally involved in every intellectual product upon which you may work. This was not an easy task for a sociologist. Charles Wright Mills quoted, not without self-mockery, a somewhat biting remark by the critic Edmund Wilson on the subject. Quote, as for my experience with books by experts in anthropology and sociology, it has led me to conclude that the requirement in my ideal university of having the papers in every department passed by a professor of English might result in revolutionizing these subjects, if indeed the second of them, sociology, survives at all. Beatrice Webb's autobiography, My Apprenticeship, as well as the socio-autobiographic novels of today, can be read as an attempt to refute a verdict that has haunted my discipline since the publications of its founder, August Comte. Sociologists cannot write well. Second, Germany after 1945, Goethe as a moral compass. At the suggestion of Morris Ginsberg, professor of sociology in the University of London, a series of discussion meetings on the German mind and outlook was organized in England in 1942 and 1943. Two years later, the lectures were published as a book whose object, it was said in the foreword, is to aid in the understanding of the gifted, efficient, hardworking, disciplined, romantic, unstable, inflammable, and formidable nation with which we, for the second time in a generation, find ourselves at war. During the Nazi regime, these two Germanys had become a greater enigma than ever before. The German mind and outlook closed with a clear indication which moral compass Germany would have to follow after the end of the Nazi regime if it wanted to re-enter the civilized world. Whatever may be the coming shape of German society, it is impossible to envisage a condition that shall be stable, pacific, and humane, unless it embodies the master ideas of Goethe, faith in individual development, sympathy and unity with nature, vision and imagination unceasingly transforming the mundane and commonplace into symbol, drama, and poetry. One year after members of the Institute of Sociology and of the English Goethe Society had recommended Goethe as moral compass for the Germans after the fall of the Nazi regime, a German author did the same. Friedrich Meinecke, the 84-year-old, half-blind doyen of German historians, published a book with the title Die Deutsche Katastrophe, the German Catastrophe. Meinecke had been, if somewhat reluctantly, a defender of the Weimar Republic. During the Third Reich, he had basically been a bystander. He was no racist and no longer the anti-Semit of his student years. In his professional actions, he remained untainted by the Nazi ideology and courageously tried to help Jewish colleagues wherever it was possible. Yet, he felt pride and happiness 
over the success of the German armies in Poland and in France. Meinecke would not have written a book with the title The German Catastrophe had the Nazis won the Second World War. The German Catastrophe was a book that had a tragic element in it. It was a catastrophe itself. After the First World War, Max Weber had warned that the political problems of the present could not be solved by looking back to Germany's intellectual or cultural achievements in the past. To read the Weimar classics, Weber wrote, was useful because after the tr Treaty of Versailles, they reminded the Germans of the fact that a country could be a cultural leader in times of military political defeat and foreign domination. Beyond this, however, the classics should be read only for pleasure and for the formal training of the mind, not for political guidance. Nothing could be further from the key message in Meinecke's book than Max Weber's warning not to look back to the classics for political advice. The German catastrophe must have been widely read. It went through four printings in the first three years after its publication. Had the German mind, asked Meinecke, survived the disaster the Nazis inflicted upon Germany? There were, Meinecke happily observed, signs of life. Quote, one hears of culture leagues and culture committees in the cities. One hears of theatrical productions in which the treasures of German drama are again rising into the light. Young men and old crowd to concerts in which the great old German music is played. Now more than ever, Meinecke wrote, the Germans had to rely on religion, culture and learning to regain credit in the world. He imagined a specific organization where the spiritual rebirth of the nation would be undertaken. What he longed to see in the future were communities of like-minded friends of high culture. He called them Goethe communities. To these communities would fall the task of conveying into the heart of the listener through sound, the most vital evidence of the great German spirit. The regular music and poetry festival hours, as he called them, would have much in common with a religious service. Meinecke wanted to schedule these hours for a weekly late Sunday afternoon, if at all possible in a church. On these occasions, the listeners would detect an indestructible German character in the midst of all the destruction and misfortune of our fatherland. Some favorable experiences from which the Germans could profit in the attempt to reconstruct their culture, Meinecke wrote, come even from the Third Reich. The sly Goebbels knew precisely, for example, how one could snare harmless souls by putting a couple of good articles worth their price in the show window of the Nazi party. Every Sunday morning at church time, when he wanted to keep people from attending service, Goebbels, Goebbels offered them on the radio a little treasure chest that gave the most beautiful German music and choice political pieces to those who listened in. An important strategy of Nazi propaganda had been the deliberate production or performance of apolitical works of art, whereby movies played a crucial role. This led, for example, Hitler's favorite film propagandist, Leni Riefenstahl, to later pretend that she had distanced herself from the Nazi regime because the movie she produced during the war, Tiefland, was a romantic film, the opposite of politics ideology, and war. Meinecke's recollections make it obvious that he did not want the repair of German cultural life to become a part of the allied denazification process. 
Cultural repair was the Germans' business alone. It could not be done by foreigners, and it should not be attempted in the sphere of politics. The harmless soul of the historian fell prey to the sly Goebbels when he declared that spiritual life and striving for spiritual values are their own justification and work most deeply when their movements can be most free from political tendencies. Meinecke wanted the Nazi uncultured spirit to disappear after 1945. Yet when he warned that it should not be replaced by pale, empty, abstract cosmopolitanism, he was almost alluding to Goebbels' attempt to free German culture from any Western influence. In 1935, the Nazis had forced Meinecke to resign as editor of the most important history journal in Germany, the Historische Zeitschrift. After 1945, Meinecke belonged to a group of distinguished historians who tried to tell a counter tale in which the good Germany had prevailed and Goethe had triumphed over Bismarck. Meinecke wanted above all to keep the remembrance of the good Germany alive. In the German catastrophe, he took great pains to point to the sacral elements of German culture. He thereby contributed to the survival of the aesthetic legacy of the Nazi regime that had attracted the German masses and quite a few members of the cultural elite. In the end, Meinecke's book became a symbol of the German catastrophe it claimed to analyze. When the two Germanys were reunited, the revision of German partition came to be regarded as an instance of divine grace. In a political theological context, reunification was seen as a true miracle indeed. Yet there remained unbelievers, voices that spoke out against political reunification. Günter Grass had always preferred Herder's cultural nation to the Reich that had been imposed upon the German states by Bismarck. For the West German Grass, joined by the East German Stefan Heim, reunification was neither morally justified nor politically desirable. Both pleaded for a federation of the two Germanys in a unified Europe. A unified Germany, Kass argued, would run the danger of again developing the nationalistic attitude that had caused Europe and the world so much harm in the past. Kass implored the Germans to happily resign themselves to exist as one cultural nation in a political confederation. In Germany, Grass' position was widely discussed, but not taken seriously. The rapid political changes made it quickly forgotten. The intervention of Günter Grass was an example of the irresistible German urge to solve a political problem in the field of culture. Immediately after Nazi defeat, a moral compass had to be found for a Germany that wanted to be accepted again by the civilized world. Culture had to play a great role thereby. After 1989, however, a unified democratic Germany was much less in need of a moral compass, rather it had to find its orientation with the help of a realpolitik that would not hinder but promote the process of European unification. Third, turning business people and other professionals into moral leaders with the help of belles lettres. The third part of my talk is a follow-up to a project by Merv Emre, an associate professor of English at the University of Oxford, whom I got to know when she was a fellow at the Wissenschaftskolleg. Her project was entitled Post-Discipline, Literature, 
professionalism and the crisis of the humanities. Equally concerned with the fate of the humanities, I am especially interested in attempts to help various professions find a moral compass with the help of literature. Great Literature for Great Leaders is the title of a course that business students can take in their last semester at Stanford University. Reading good books makes future managers better people. That is the message of a video with which Scotty McLennan promotes the course. McLennan is a lawyer, the former Dean for Religious Life at Stanford, and now a lecturer in political economy at its graduate school of business. Given his past as a theologian, it is no surprise that McLennan's video message sounds like a sermon. He preaches to his students that literature helps in a very honest and penetrating way, he says, to develop virtue and moral courage in the workplace. Novels and stories, Scotty argues, show reality in a way that case studies and biographies cannot touch. The last tycoon, for instance, Scott Fitzgerald's latest unfinished novel describes in a masterful way how a business leader moves around in his world. Successful in his job, yet plagued by disarray in his private relations, the protagonist asks himself how he could find a balanced way to live. This question, so McLennan, students should ask themselves in their last year when they are about to leave the business school and to enter the job market. Great literature for great leaders is the cause that should help them find an answer to that question by reading and interpreting great books. Among these are Jane Austen's Emma, Henrik Ibsen's drama, An Enemy of the People, Hermann Hesse's Siddhartha, The Plague by Albert Camus, and Kazuo Ishiguro's Remains of the Day. McLennan's favorites are what he calls the American dream books, of which Francis Scott Fitzgerald's novels are the best example. After having read these books, the students will become convinced that they have to keep their humanity always in sight if they want to be successful with their stakeholders. At the end of his video message, McLennan claims that the most successful business leaders will not be those who try to maximize their self-interest. On the contrary, people who try to run their business in a passionate way will usually do better in the long run. At this point, the introduction to great literature for great leaders almost sounds like a refutation of Adam Smith's famous passage in the Wells of Nations. It is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own self-interest. We address ourselves not to their humanity, but to their self-love and never talk to them of our own necessities, but of their advantages. Great literature for great readers, leaders tries to correct a basic, basic assumption of neoliberal economic thought. The role model for courses that use literature to teach business ethics was a seminar that Robert Coles gave for the first time at the Harvard Business School in 1985 under the title, The Business World, Moral and Social Inquiry Through Fiction. Robert Coles had studied English literature. The poet and physician William Carlos Williams, whom he interviewed, persuaded him to go into medicine. Coles became a famous child psychiatrist, who in 1973 received a Pulitzer Prize for his book, Children in Crisis. In 1987, he described the intention 
behind his seminar at the business school in an article in the New York Times. At the center of the seminar, Cole's wrote, was the enjoyment of fiction, of course, but we concentrated on novels and stories that address the 20th century American business world directly or indirectly. The writers the seminars dealt with included Francis Scott Fitzgerald, Saul Bellow, and John Cheever. These authors were, Coles wrote, affectionately interested in their subject and worked hard with the magic storytellers possess to render faithfully, honestly, fully, a way of life familiar to many of us who live and work in what gets called the corporate world. When no less than $30 million were given to Harvard's business school to encourage the teaching of ethics, a heated discussion took place in Cole's classroom to decide what to do with that money. It was a sign of how much his students had been impressed by the readings they had been assigned to that one proposal suggested <coughs> Robert should use the money to buy thousands of copies of Walker Percy's and John Cheever's books and distribute them not only to business school students, but to corporate leaders across the United States. The seminar of Coles, The Business World, Moral and Social Inquiry Through Fiction, was a seminar of a child psychiatrist. And it had all the hallmarks of a therapeutic session in which literature became the cure. Stanford's sermon was Harvard's therapy. Coles closed his article with a look into the future. I can picture us meeting in a boardroom in a Manhattan skyscraper years from now, some students now in positions of authority, others perhaps having left the business world altogether, but all of us deliberating yet again the whys of human nature in the manner good novelists so often recommend, with an emphasis on life's ironies, paradoxes, and complexities. Giving moral concerns a prominent place in a business school was not just the result of inner academic curriculum planning. It was also a reaction to financial scandals in Wall Street. In the 1980s, the stock trader Ivan Frederick Buski, nicknamed Ivan the Terrible, and the investment banker Dennis Levine were charged and convicted of insider training, trading. Buski later served as a model for Gordon Gecko in the movie Wall Street. Responsible for his promotion was the famous or rather infamous speech on the positive aspects of greed he had delivered during a commencement ceremony at Berkeley. Levine wrote a book, Inside Out, an insider's account of Wall Street, in which he accepted responsibility for what he had done, but complained that as a student, he had never been confronted with ethical issues. He now stressed the importance of ethical standards in business, using his own career as a deterring important example. Coles convinced that stories can work their magic on the heart, was sure that neither Buski nor Levine would have committed their crimes had they only read the right books. After their trials, the subject of ethics in the business world was on the minds of everyone. One week before the publication of Cole's article in the New York Times, which was a plea to give ethical issues a greater part in the curriculum of business schools, the stock markets on Wall Street experienced the biggest crash of the post-war period. Robert Cole's seminar was part of Harvard's leadership and ethics program. Today, the program runs under the ambitious title, The Moral Leader. It resembles Stanford's Great Literature for Great Leaders seminar, 
and it can be easily confused with leadership through fiction in the elective course at the Business School of Columbia University. Mav Emre participated in one of its sessions. The moral leader program, she argued, is less about moral education by reading and more about empowering a new type of managerial leader. In old school management training, Emre wrote, the emphasis was on becoming a hard-nosed leader, putting the company's bottom line first. Attempts at maintaining a good work-life balance and showing empathy with colleagues and subordinates were seen as sentimentality. But today, these authoritarian models of command and control are out. Empathy, sensitivity, mindfulness, and relationship building are in. Yet, empathy in these programs is not seen as a precursor to a politics of solidarity. It is a method for acquiring and maintaining power over others. A teaching guide entitled The Moral Leader at Harvard's Business School, where Machiavelli's The Prince is the first title on the syllabus, puts it bluntly. This is a perfect place to start moral leadership since leadership requires the use of power. This is about power, how to get it and preserve it, a necessary condition of leadership. Clearly, not all programs that claim to make managers better readers and thereby better leaders can be equated. Listening to Stanford's Scotty McLennan, one becomes convinced that he really intends to replace greed and selfishness in the business world with empathy. In many programs of this kind, however, literature serves as a shield behind which the old predatory capitalism is hiding. Seeing the reading of great books as a means to strengthen the moral awareness of the reader is a special challenge in the education of business students who are preparing for a profession in which the pursuit of profit maximization and emotion neutral action are the maxims of conduct. It seems less ambitious and surprising, but almost natural to use examples of literature in the law school curriculum. For years, law professors have woven works of literature into classes and seminars to tell the stories of law. Using these works, professors and students dissect scenarios not otherwise encountered in traditional legal curricula. With these remarks, students are introduced to the program using literature to make better lawyers at the University of Virginia School of Law. The focus of the program, one of many at law schools worldwide, is directed towards texts like V.S. Naipaul's A Bend in the River, Ian McEwan's Atonement, and J.M. Cousy's Disgrace. For a better understanding of criminal law, students should read crime novels like Raymond Chandler's The Big Sleep, and even Jane Austen's novel Emma, in which law plays a relatively minor role, can help them draw conclusions about problems they will face later, later in their careers. But will those judges more fairly? Will those judges judge more fairly? Prosecutors plead more convincingly, and lawyers defend their clients with greater success who as students have read stories of law? This can be justifiably doubted, but it does not change the fact that literature traditionally plays a major role in legal education. The law and literature movement started in the 1970s with the publication of James Boyd White's classic, The Legal Imagination. It was a reaction to the law and economics movement that had won more and more influence. 
For White, law was not a science, but an art, the art of a specific way of talking and writing. The lawyer was an artist, author, and interpreter. Literature could strengthen the jurist's ability to judge and improve his sense of justice, law in literature. Methods of literary criticism could help in better understanding legal texts, law as literature. A look at the literature canon shows what a major role law plays in it. From Sophocles, Antigone, to Kleist, Michael Kohlhaas, the fairy tales of the Brothers Grimm, Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, and Franz Kafka's The Trial. Even though medical doctors appear in novels and dramas as often as lawyers do, it is not so much the knowledge of literary texts as linguistic competence in listening, speaking, and sometimes writing that plays a major role in their medical education. The linguistic training of doctors and other health professionals can help to strengthen empathy towards patients. The University of Southern California, for instance, offers a master of narrative medicine in the fundamental assumption that stories matter in the clinical encounter. The students learn how to interpret and react emphatically to stories of illness. At the Medical Humanities Lab of the University of Massachusetts, students are told that every doctor carries a black bag filled with poems and stories. The future medical doctors are asked to write stories or essays in reaction to key episodes in the medical training. These texts are then assembled in a podcast with the title Murmurs, Stories from Our Journeys in Medicine. In the medical humanities, as they are called, narrations play a central role in the doctor-patient relationship. They require linguistic sensitivity and interpretative competence. Basically, every practitioner should be a master of science in narrative medicine. This includes the doctor's language-bound reflection on his own actions, as well as the encouragement to the patient to write down his life and medical history in detail. Reading stories and poems as a way to address emotions and create empathy, something that can hardly be achieved within the framework of a curriculum oriented towards scientific and technical medicine. The recourse to fiction or the promotion of narrative competence seems self-evident in medicine. Trivial in jurisprudence and often enough hypocritical in managerial training. Attempts to strengthen moral awareness and competence in the education of professionals with the help of literature are not without controversy. The controversy is part of a larger debate on the effect of so-called great books on the reader. Against the tendency of universities to put more and more emphasis on the sciences and the teaching of readily marketable skills, many see certain reading certain hello texts as an indispensable means to influence the moral and intellectual development of the individual student. Liberal, as opposed to practical education, should be based on the reading of great books. Starting, for example, in some courses with Plato, Aristotle and Homer, and including authors like Shakespeare, Dickens and Tolstoy. Proponents of the great books approach are not only convinced that reading these texts makes the reader a better person, they also claim that it has a fundamentally democratizing impulse. Opponents argue that overselling great books courses and undervaluing the aims and contributions of other academic curricula damages the educational goal of the university. 
The controversy can be summed up by citing two comments. The first pro-grade book statement, I want nurses, computer scientists, accountants, engineers, entrepreneurs, lawyers, and professionals of every kind to be liberally educated, that is, first to read great books. The counter argument, the idea that students develop a greater capacity for empathy by reading books in literature classes about people who never existed, then they can, by taking classes in fields that study actual human behavior, does not make a lot of sense. The examples I have talked about, attempts at trying to offer a moral compass to managers, lawyers, and doctors can be seen as part of the great books controversy. We are in a field of surprises where literature appears in unexpected places. This is what happened to the law student, Gustave Flaubert, confronted with legal textbooks. For the first time, he explained, incredible, that's literature. Thank you. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Leopoldis. As well, you have taken us on a very, a very long journey from the starting point of 1945. I hope uh, it was not too long. I was given. Well, no, no. On the contrary, the, we could have gone on for you. Could have gone on for much longer. <laughs> no, that's very stimulating. I mean, the notion that emerges, it seems to me, is that literature is too easily kidnapped and taken prisoner by interests, which claim to be, as it were, liberalizing hard-nosed interests. But in the end, as you said about one of the programs, they were designed to uh, increase people's power. They were a means to an end. Yeah. That is right. That is the danger. But I would like to distinguish. I mentioned this, this Scotty McLennan, the former theologian at Stanford University. When you listen, at to his video, you see this man is convinced. He believes in literature and he believes that students will become better managers and better people when they read these books. I believe him. Others, I don't believe a bit. Hmm. And of course, it's, it's another story in law and in medicine, where also the empathy of using literature is much less, it is, so to speak, much normal to talk about, to use literature in legal studies. It is almost necessary to use it in medicine. It is not necessary, it seems to some, or maybe the most to use it in manager managerial training, mm -hmm. but it is. But as I said and quoted Merv Emery, it is used not to the purpose to make people better. It is used to help man managers to find new strategies to establish power they must have about their clients and uh, compatriots. Well, you've raised most I like the word hijacking. It is a story of hijacking. Yes, but yes. Some hijackers are quite nice, yes. and others are quite mean. Yes, a better word hijacking than kidnapping. I agree. Yes. yes. Well, I'm sure that other people are, must be bursting to ask questions or make comments on such a, a stimulating lecture. Um, may, may I come in here? Um, because um, indeed, I'm sure many people will have questions. Uh, you, before you um, uh, uh, plunge in, you should be aware that the uh, this session is being recorded, and uh, if you do not wish to be recorded, uh, you uh, but but do wish to ask a question, uh, you should put it in the chat. Uh, where I will uh, uh, find it, and I will then be able to pass on the question. On the other hand, if you're happy uh, to uh, uh, be recorded, then, then you can simply ask your question. Although, since there are quite a few of us here, it might be helpful. Uh, I, I will now moderate this. It might be helpful if you would use the little raised hand to signal that you want to ask a question, and then I can try to make sure that there 
uh, dealt with in in uh, in some kind of order. So I, um, say that I look especially forward to those comments that will not be recorded. <laughs> right. Um, and uh, 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 Professor Lepinis has said that he's happy to take questions in English or in uh, German. So I think with that, I think we can start the start the discussion. And as usual, um, I'm going to jump in <laughs> uh, and, and ask one of my own. Uh, uh, Lepinis, to, to someone sitting in this country, it, the, much of this seems to be very much an American phenomenon. Can, yeah. can you comment on that, that, that this is something that we don't see a, a great deal of, or at least not as much uh, as, as, uh, as one does seems to, seem to, seems to see in the United States? What is, the, can you account for that? No, I think you are right. It is the same in Germany. I mean, we have not much of this hijacking, let's call it, in managerial training. But we have, of course, the German law schools use literature a lot. And we have what is called a humane me, human medicines. No, you, is it human? No, I, I forgot. Humanistic medicine, where literature is used, but not so much in business schools. So it is an American phenomenon. I think it has, I don't know. I, I don't know of, ex, of examples from England and I apologize from that. I should have looked a little bit more closely. I think it has a little bit to do with the kind of curriculum planning in the United States. And I think there, there is a premium of developing these courses in business schools. You can clearly see that. They talk about hundreds of students who take these courses. And I'm not sure whether they take it because they want to become better managers or whether they want to have a good time. I think it is an American phenomenon, you are right, but it is not confined to the United States. But I think the structure of the American educational system allows these things much more easily than it would be possible in Germany. Yes, thank you very much. I think uh, uh, Astrid Kohler has a comment there that might it have developed out of the liberal arts programs, which are a feature of American higher education. Um, uh, 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 sorry, I have an Ellen anyway, who wishes to speak. Um, do you... Shall I speak or do you want to yeah, take yeah. that? Do you want to take Astrid's question first? Um, Yes, perhaps we'll just start with Astrid's question, um, uh, that it might have come out of um, the liberal arts uh, programs in the United States. Perhaps that's just a comment, I don't know. Right, oh, let's take uh, uh, Ellen, Ellen Pillsworth's question then. Thank you. Um, I was really interested in the point you made about these courses promising to teach empathy as a means of control. And I would like to know how that would work. I, you, I don't know if that's something that you can talk about how in a kind of, I guess I'm wondering how can you use empathy to yeah, maintain power? And then I was thinking about in a therapeutic interaction between a therapist and a client where empathy is you know, the main where that the therapist is sort of trading and how those, uh, relationships do often end up in a in a in a power imbalance where the client becomes dependent on the therapist and is that the sort of thing that you think is implied here that learning how to empathize can can make people sort of dependent on you or um, I, I don't know if that's something you can talk about more I, I hesitate a little bit uh, to, uh, not to answer the question but to answer it properly because I've never attended such a course I mean, to, to, answer, uh, to answer your question, really, I would have to be able to talk from experience, which I cannot do. But I think it is, uh, let's use the word hijacked again, it is a way of trying to hijack the client, the competitor, whatever, that you seem to be someone who is interested 
in him as a moral being, being as a private person, or whatever. It is a clever strategy. What I wonder at is because you see, I'm relying here on literature. This is on I have read, not on my own experience. I'm wondering whether that was not always the case. And that the attention now is drawn to this because literature plays such a role. I would believe that in traditional business schools, the training of empathy, showing empathy for gaining control was always part of the curriculum, whether directly or indirectly. But now it is done with the help of literature. That is the new thing as far as I can tell. But I think maybe I'm wrong, but I, I think I, if I would look closely, I would find it everywhere, but not everywhere with the help of literature. That is, as far as I can tell, a new phenomenon. Yeah, it's very interesting that one would need to rely on literature for that as well. As you say, when there's real world, there's the real world around us too, but yeah. But uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, other questions? The, the, to go back to the American theme, one, one is uh, uh, reminded of that uh, great bestseller by Dale Carnegie, uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People. That's it. And, um, as, as you say, um, if that is the aim, then literature merely becomes a means uh, to, to, that, to that end. Um, it also makes me think of the, of the old line, um, sincerity is the most important thing. If you can fake that, You've got it made. <laughs> yeah, but again, I would say, uh, I would distinguish, uh, I, I have mentioned this uh, Scotty McLennan at uh, Stanford, but also this Robert Coles, who was a child psychiatrist. When you read what they write about their courses, then you have the feeling that they are sincere. But of course, they are used in the curriculum of the business school in which they are operating. That is clear. Yeah. But I personally, there are persons, I believe, that they believe in what they are doing, and others, I do not believe. Yeah. <laughs> but the selling point is, is still that they will, that the empathetic managers or managers who have become empathetic through reading literature will also run more successful build businesses. That is what Scotty McLennan says, yes. Uh, uh, the more good books you read, the better your profit will So it will be good for the bottom line. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm speaking too much. Uh, we have Ellen again. I don't know whether, uh, is there anyone else who would like to jump in? But otherwise, Ellen, go ahead. Sorry, if there is anyone else, I will go away. But um, I just on this point, uh, I was thinking about um, there's a film, a documentary film called Work Hard, Play Hard. And it's about this uh, phenomenon with office buildings where they design them, uh, where they make sure there's a bar there and, uh, you know, that everyone has these open workspaces and cozy chairs. And it's kind of part of this same neoliberal uh, strategy of making you stay at work longer because you feel so comfortable and you can have a beer and uh, yeah. So just another kind of angle on that. Yeah, but you see, this is, this is happening and this is empathy training. The new thing is that instead of, I don't know, a, a bar or a play or whatever, you would have a couch and there would be books and you would tell people sit there and read this book for two hours and then come back and you will see it will help you a lot with your business. This is the new thing in it. Because yep. Dale Carnegie was mentioned, of course, it was always part of the business education, but to rely so much on books, yep. that is new as far as I can tell. Good. We have a question from uh, Jeremy Adler. Jeremy, you need to unmute. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, Wolf. Thank you for that no. brilliant lecture. Um, Good to see you, Wolf. <laughs> uh, I think marvelously continues your uh, your last book uh, and, and and brings us right up to date. Uh, I'd just like to ask you a, 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 for a little thought. Um, 
there, there seems to be a little tension between Max Weber on the classics, who you quoted so interestingly, and the third part of your lecture, uh, where um, the classics do become a kind of panacea in the tradition of James uh, Boyd White yes. and so on. I just wonder um, if you have any thoughts on that. Well, it, it's a very good and intriguing question. And I think one might say that when Weber said, don't treat the classics if you want to do this kind of repair, maybe one should ask Weber today if there are not other books which could be read in achieving this. This, this is what I take from, from uh, your question. I mean, you see, these, these people you don't use the classics. Well, maybe they use the classics, but it's not in the sense as Weber used them. And so I think it would, the, the question, I cannot really answer it. Yes, there is a tension. How should this, this tension be solved? Um, One might say to Weber, if we are talking about the right books of the classics, they might achieve exactly that, where you claim it cannot be achieved by reading them. One would have to look at his syllabus, so to speak. I think it would all depend on that. Absolutely. Just as a kind of footnote, I mean, Weber doesn't exactly keep to his own rule when, for instance, at the end of the Protestant ethic, he quotes Goethe's Faust yeah. um, and uh, treats Faust as a uh, symbol, really, of modernity. And Faust's Streben comes to mean the symbol of modernity for Weber. So perhaps the tension is in Weber himself? Yes, I think. Weber, in some sense, did not obey what he was preaching. Because, I mean, literature plays such an important role in him. But I think he didn't want this to become, how should I say, a kind of strömung, so that all people would just do this. But someone like Weber, of course, he could use, in quotation marks, the classics, and could achieve the, the desired political goals by it, because he was able to do that. I think his feeling was, and I mean, Weber, one should not forget, Weber was an aristocrat. I mean, he was a Democrat, but he was also very aristocratic. And I think he more or less reserved using the classics for political persons. I, I overdo it a little bit to himself, but he didn't want to become it a part of the education generally, that would be my feeling. But I'm somewhat speculating here. But the question is very good, it intrigues me, and I have not the feeling I've answered it well, but I will think about it. Thank you. I think the moral is we can't all be Max Weber. Sorry? We can't all be Max Weber. We, we can't all be Max Weber. Yeah, okay. <laughs> We, we, we shouldn't, perhaps. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you know his biography a bit, I must say I'm very happy that I'm not Max Weber. I don't want to be tormented like he was in life. Terrible. Good. Uh, are there, oh, Jim, you have a, Jim, are, are you raising your hand? Yes, I, I was indeed. Um, I was wondering whether one can't shift the ground a little bit um, and think about the post-war, post-Second World War, uh, World War situation. <clears throat> We're talking so far a lot about um, education as part of the training of people from early on in their careers and what it might mean to their uh, practice in later professional life. But another aspect of morality in th through literature is critical morality. And to take the obvious example, uh, the critical writing in German literature on the Nazi period, which mm -hmm. has been a major theme ever since 19, well, ever since the 1960s at least, or late, late 50s, and continues in, in people like Schlink and von Schirach. Mm -hmm. um, this is a, 
a moral preaching, if you like, or a critical view of the historical past, which the nation that is addressed is meant to take to heart. This is not training. This is not training. This is a revisionist view mm -hmm. of whatever you thought when you were living under Nazism. And that's a quite different angle on, on the moral role of literature. Um, the other thing I want to say really is that we are all implicit in this use of literature because what I said in my introduction that we uh, like to believe that literature does have a humanizing and enlightening effect. It's what gives meaning to our activities as scholars and teachers. In a sense, we are um, instrumentalizing literature in that way, although for the highest of, highest of, of uh, ideals. I mean, if you go right back to the principle of aesthetics, that the aesthetic state is a state of disinterestedness. We have our cake and eat it too. We treat, teach literature, we talk about aesthetics as a matter of, of uh, disinterestedness, but then we have an interest. Yeah. So we are all in this game together in one way or another. Yes, I, I, I could not agree more with uh, what you have said. I just wanted to add something because you talked about these, let's call them critical authors after 1945. I have not closely looked at the syllabus, so to speak, Meinecke recommended to the Germans after 1945. But I'm quite con convinced that 80% of the authors he wanted people to read after 1945 were those who were also recommended by the Nazis or by Goebbels precisely. <clears throat> they were not those who could not publish during the Nazi regime. I have I've ne not read that uh, the late uh, Thomas Mann or whatever does not belong there. They are the classics who were used mm. by Goebbels as well, and now they were used by him. Mm. Yes. Good. Uh, are there any more questions? Um, I, I was wondering, uh, again, if I could just <laughs> uh, misuse my, uh, oh. my, my... Ah, is there someone? Oh. It I can't, I can't find the little hand. Uh, well, you're you're on. I'm on. <laughs> you have the floor. No, 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 I haven't really got a question. It was just a, a comment about um, the field of medical humanities that came up. And just to speak greatly in favour of the use of literature hmm. in, medi in the medical field. Hmm. And uh, a, a colleague of mine, Heike Bartel, had a project looking at uh, anorexia among men, you know, young men, which is so much less explored than among women. And we had several meetings with a great range of different expertise with doctors and health workers and uh, academics from various parts of the country. And um, I talked a bit about uh, Kafka, of course, and the Humor Kunstler, and also Magersucht, and the, you know, which was already being written about in the 18th century and mm. was in possibly to Devalfavanschaft. And, and the really interesting thing I thought was the way that the actual methods of analyzing and reading stories transferred then to what patients tell of their conditions and of looking at the patients uh, uh, how they themselves see their condition as a kind of storytelling and then using some of the analytical methods that we literary people do and this uh, seemed to me to be actually very fruitful and my colleague Heike Bartel uh, even won a prize for it, and it has been distributed among um, the, the health service here. So I, I, I wanted to bring this in as a, a, a positive and hopeful way in which uh, uh, literature can be taken up and used in, in the field of, of medicine. Indeed, you said that, I think, that we can't imagine a lot of medical activity without looking at literature to some extent. 
But thank you very much for your very interesting survey of all the various ways in which literature can be expropriated or used. And I wanted to bring a very positive way of, of that interaction. Thank you. I, I hope I didn't sound negative when I talked about medicine. No, no, no not at all. Yes. Because are we still there? Yes, we're, yes. Yes, we're there. Yep. Because narrative medicine is something which I find perhaps most impressive of all the things I've read. Yeah. But something, something is interesting which I didn't know before. The most, there are very impressive tales, narrations of patients. But the, the most impressive, impressive for me was narrations of doctors who tell about their medical experience with certain patients. That is incredibly moving. And uh, this I have looked at a little bit, bit more closely, which you can do on, on the internet. But uh, both, are, both are very intriguing, the patients and the doctors. But again, narrative medicine, I agree, is something which I would say is almost necessary. You cannot imagine a good medical education without what they call narrative medicine. Good. Um, for anyone wondering how to raise the little yellow hand, you have to go and look for reactions uh, on the bottom of your screen and then click on that and then that will show you how to, how to raise the hand. So if anyone is still wanting to ask a question by that method. Um, I do have another little question myself. Um, do any of your authorities, the ones who promote uh, the teaching of, of uh, great books, uh, deal with the question of immoral literature? I haven't come across that, interestingly enough. Because... Um, sort of deterring example, so to speak. No. Yes, yes. I and mean, there are some, some great authors, you mentioned Flaubert, yeah. some great authors who pride themselves on the, on the yes. immorality of their, of their works. So I just wondered whether any of your uh, people had ever confronted that. If I try to recall all the titles and texts I've read about, no, immorality is almost completely absent. Mm. They assume that, I suppose there's been a filtering process. They assume that all the, all the dross and all the immoral stuff has been filtered out <laughs> by the time one gets to the great books, I guess. They are, they are, in a way, they are anti-Platonists, aren't they? So Plato thought all literature was immoral. <laughs> and these people um, uh, give, give, uh, are giving literature a great hug, a great big hug. Are there any more uh, questions? I think we're kind of getting to the end of our time, and we've probably strained... Uh, your your patients as well, uh, uh, Professor Lepenis. Uh, Jim, do you want to perhaps close, bring things yes, to a close? Indeed. Well, if, if there really are no more questions, I can't help feeling we could go on discussing these issues uh, all night. But we have had a marvelously uh, stimulating introduction to things that were far beyond what appeared in the abstract for the lecture. So we've gone, we've covered a very, uh, and I must thank you on everybody's behalf for, for that uh, uh, her Lebanese, um, and uh, I think it will take a, take time to digest what you said and think about our own commitment to the values of literature and ask ourselves some hard questions about how far we int are instrumentalizing it uh, in our own activities. And yet one wants to preserve the notion that somehow, somewhere by a back door or an underground route, Literature is doing good things which cannot be accused of interestedness in any form. I hope you would agree with that, but I'm not sure you would. Thank you very much anyway for a marvellous lecture. I will, and thank you again for having invited me. It was not only an honour, it was a pleasure. Thank you very much.